Mr. Chairman, <laughs> ladies, gentlemen, colleagues. Professor Sir Martin Harris is an alumnus of the school who's made outstanding contributions in a number of areas. And I could use up all of my allotted time today reading out the long list of offices he's held and the many honours he's received. But you, and he too, I guess, will be relieved to know I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to focus on three areas, and I'm going to be brief. First of all, Sir Martin is a distinguished linguist. The SOAS Department of Linguistics was the very first ever linguistics department in the United Kingdom, founded in 1932 as a centre for research and study in Asian and African languages. So it's perhaps not surprising that after making the mistake of taking his undergraduate degree at Cambridge, Sir Martin came to SOAS to do his PhD. <laughs> he subsequently made a major contribution to our understanding of syntax, for example, through his research on the evolution of French syntax, and he's had a big impact on the field through his general leadership of the highly influential Longman Linguistics Library. He was a member of the International Committee for Historical Linguistics from 79 to 86, a member of the National Working Group for Modern Foreign Languages, and chairman of the Governor's Centre for Information on Language Teaching. The key point about this is that in all of these roles, he encouraged and stimulated interest in languages and linguistics, something that is so important to us here at SOAS. The second thing, just to say, is that Sir Martin is one of our most highest profile alumni in the higher education world. He's been Vice-Chancellor of the University of Essex for five years, and then Vice-Chancellor of the University of Manchester for a further 12 years. Just to put that in perspective, for you, the average Vice-Chancellor these days lasts about five to six years. He was the architect of the remarkably successful merger between the University of Manchester and the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. And he was telling me, incidentally, earlier when I was saying about the number of degree ceremonies, he said, well, at Manchester, we had 40 degree ceremonies a year, so he wouldn't be saying he'd been to dozens. He's been to hundreds of degree ceremonies. His contribution to the higher education sector more generally has been extensive. Uh, he served as chairman of the committee of the vice chancellors and principals for a couple of years. He's chaired a number of important reviews in higher education. In particular, and here this emphasis that is important to us again in the fields of modern languages and postgraduate education. And in his spare time, he served on many other bodies, including, crucially, being a member of the SOAS governing body and deputy chairman of the Northwest Regional Development Agency. He's currently president of Clare Hall, Cambridge, a position from which he's retiring at the end of this summer. And the third thing I just want to mention is that Sir Martin was the first director of the Office of Fair Access, OFA, sometimes known colloquially as OFTOF, from 2004 to 2012. Now, OFA has had a mixed press, but there's been no doubting its director's commitment. As the first member of his family to be educated beyond the age of 14, to the goal of creating equality of opportunity in the university system. In a valedictory address he gave a few years ago, he said, when I was appointed to the Northwest Development Agency, the senior civil servant responsible said to me laughingly that it was a very, very long time since he'd appointed anyone so resolutely old labor to such a position. And indeed, when he was appointed to be director of offer, there were similar comments. I'm not so sure the description of old labor is quite right, but it gives an idea where Martin's sentiments and approach lie and he's striven hard over the last decade to deal with the inequalities and inequities in the higher education system. And for that, all of us should be grateful. So, Sir Martin is a scholar who's dedicated his life to public service. He's a good example of what uh, Dr. Miller was talking about earlier, of leaders that go on from SOAS. But we shouldn't forget the personal side. When I mentioned to colleagues here at SOAS and in other institutions that were giving him an honorary degree, the standard reaction was, that's a very good choice, Martin, such a nice man. Mr. Chairman, it's my privilege now to present Sir Martin Harris for the award of Doctor of Literature, to invite him to accept the degree and then to address the assembly.
Chairman, Director, graduands, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. First of all, can I say how genuinely delighted I am to be here, how grateful I am for the Director's uh, very kind words, and how specially privileged I feel to be honoured in this way by one of the two universities from which I graduated. Uh, on those two occasions, I graduated properly after hard work like all of you. Today has been rather easier. <laughs> as Paul has said, uh, SOAS was a natural choice for me to do a PhD in linguistics in the 60s. The only other choice was Edinburgh. I was a Plymouth boy. I still feel a Plymouth boy. And I already had a fiancé in Plymouth, and Edinburgh seemed an awful long way away <laughs> to two Plymouth uh, youngsters. So I was absolutely delighted when the opportunity came to come and study here. I'm very, very proud of my connection with SOAS. Uh, my doctorate here started my academic career uh, and provided a degree of intellectual and pastoral support that I think was as special then as I know you've all found it now. Just coming into the building this morning, after about, it's probably about a de decade since I've been in, I felt at once that warmth and that collegiality which has always been such a mark of SOAS. I was, as Paul said briefly, a, a governor, but what he didn't mention was that um, on two occasions I was a member of uh, working groups to look at how SOAS should be funded. Uh, you know how these things go around in circles. And on both occasions, we unsurprisingly discovered that if you fund an institution by a formula that is based entirely or very largely on undergraduate student numbers, then you cannot possibly protect the expertise in, uh, in fr less frequently studied languages and cultures, which is so absolutely central to the mission of SOAS. Uh, as it was then and as it is now, and that some form of special funding outside of formula is necessary. One thing I've never understood is why something so self-evident needs to be rediscovered every 10 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> this week is a bittersweet one for me because uh, at the end of the week, I'm uh, finally retiring after more than 51 years of direct involvement in, in UK higher education. And I, uh, if you'll excuse me the indulgence, I could say, I would love to say, that I wouldn't have achieved a fraction of what I've achieved without the support of that same Barbara that I talked about earlier, who's been my wife now for 46 years, and I'd like to say. I am, however, continuing as chairman of the University Superannuation Scheme, Britain's second largest, largest pension scheme, and one that has a lot of interest to most of the people on this <laughs> platform. Um, what I would say is it's obvious, isn't it, that an undergraduate degree in Romance Philology and a graduate degree in Linguistics equips you perfectly for being chairman of a vast pension fund in difficult times. <laughs> um, uh, one last thing uh, that Paul mentioned that I just wanted to say a word about. Uh, I, I'm absolutely proud of having kept aloft uh, all of my career the flag of equality of opportunity. Despite what Paul rightly said about a mixed press, it seems to me that the concept that young people of proven ability should have an equal chance to go to a selective university, to engage in postgraduate work, to have fair access to the labour market. All of those th things seem to me to be absolutely self-evident. They're not really matters of a discussion at all. And yet elements of the media have found them controversial. And the people who held my role as director of offer uh, have, uh, uh, have experienced that. It seems to me that a young person of ability who attends an excellent school, who has supportive parents and a peer group will do well but someone of equal ability at a poor school and with parents with no experience or knowledge of higher education, isn't it reasonable that they should be considered with special care and given the opportunities that their abilities merit? I had that chance, the first of my family 50 odd years ago, and I think others in the position I was in then should have that chance too. It seems to me astonishing 
that some elements of the media take exception to that self-evident proposition. And so as taught me, as a young man from a supportive but monocultural background, of the diversity of talent from other countries, from other cultures, and from other ethnicities across the world. That was a revelation and an understanding that I didn't get either in my home city of Plymouth or in the monocultural undergraduate college I attended, but which I uh, got really strongly here at SARS. And again, coming in again this morning, one sensed how strong that still is. And that was part of diversity and equality of opportunity that seems to me that SOAS has always been particularly uh, successful in maintaining. Mr. Chairman, I'm very proud that an alma mater which gave me so much when I was so much younger has given me so much more today in awarding me this honor. And I'd like finally to say to all of you graduating today, your SOAS experience will serve you well. This is a moment of opportunity for you all. Seize it and use it as you move on to the next stage of your lives. Graduands, I salute you.